In 2013, people are flocking to Atlanta to be part of the cultural hotspot of the South. Since it was the home of Dr. King, it was kind of like the holy grail, so to speak, for African Americans. Atlanta was kind of the gateway to changing the South to obvious what it is today. While the exterior of the ATL is lit, the soul of the city is enriched by its deep religious roots. You need to lift your hands and say, Lord, I know the process. And one day he gonna wake up and say, hey, I got it now, mama. I know what it takes now. You have so many churches on every corner, various denominations, various faiths, and we all get along. Churches have always been very big as a part of Atlanta. Uh, you had the who's who in church, and the major churches were here in Atlanta that was making an impact across the country. They had a lot of well-known mega pastors that was here. Atlanta was just the place to be. Just after midnight on May 7th, 2013, a 911 call comes in to Atlanta Dispatch. A distraught woman says her stepfather has just been shot in their house. You get the call, there's a person shot, they're requesting an ambulance. Police rush to the home of 47-year-old Jarek Jackson in the affluent neighborhood of Riverside, just 20 minutes outside of downtown Atlanta. And the officers get to the scene, and there is the horse in the driveway with doors open and people crying, a lot of what you consider chaos. Then you step into the scene, an uh, individual was shot. He was shot in the torso area, it was multiple shots. Clinging to life, the victim is rushed to Grady Memorial Hospital, while police immediately talk to Jarek's fiance, Kimberly Little, who witnessed the shooting. We learned from Kimberly Little, Jarek Jackson, that Kimberly Little had just picked up their daughter from college, and they brought her home. So they decided to go grab something to eat. They was driving their Porsche SUV. When they drove back home, they turned into their driveway, but they was being followed uh, by a dark car. Nobody was alarmed at the time of the car just riding behind them. Jarek loved trains and uh, he would have a train set, a large one, set up in his room at, at the house. And uh, it was interesting that later on in his life, the last place he worked was at Southern Railroad as a, a engineer. He loved the railroad. He loved his job and what he did. The thing he loved about his job was the activity Sometimes, of course, as a train to go out of town, and uh, you know that excited him more than anything because he was the type of person that, uh, eight to five, or just sitting at a desk all day long, wasn't gonna be Jerry. Jerry had to have constant movement and things going on around him. So the rest of we were almost grew up as homebodies, and Jerry grew up like. He don't know what homebodies even meant. He was always gone. And so that was the type of guy he was. It just so happened one day, I was watching a guy preach on television, and I said to myself, I said, well, I can do better than him on my off day. And so I began to go downtown Atlanta and began to preach right there at Five Point. And every week, I would be down there preaching. And from that point, it turned into the ministry. So I am the founding and senior pastor of Gospel Tabernacle Word in Action Ministry. The philosophy of the church was put the word in action we kind of made church more of saying, come hear the message, get the message. And we weren't focusing so much on the religion. And it, it drew people. It just began to explode. And since we were actively engaged in all of the issues, 
that were existing in the community. This was kind of the first time in Atlanta that the church said, no, we are not going to stay inside the walls on Sunday morning. If it takes getting to on the street to push the cause, or if it took letting politicians know that, you know, we have certain needs, and if they didn't pay attention to our need, we were encouraging people to vote, registering people to vote, and people of color began to have a greater impact in Atlanta. Although we were still in the Deep South, back in 2013, Atlanta was kind of the gateway to changing the South to what it is today. Well, the, the case was assigned to the, the gang unit. We get complex cases, that's what we do. Uh, when, we, when I say complex cases, a lot of moving parts, multiple co-defendants, those are the type of cases that came to the gangs, drugs, and uh, guns unit. So when the case came to me, it was a, it was a multiple co-defendant case. Uh, so was, I knew there was a lot of moving parts. And so when we get the case, I'm in charge of uh, gathering all the evidence and reinvestigating as much as I can so that the prosecutors can handle all the legal argument that, that will take place inside of the courtroom. Another part of my job is assuring witnesses are in undisclosed locations till it's time for them to come forward because of fear of retaliation. So sometimes they'll go with a family member or they will go with a friend. I will make sure that they're in that, lo they're in that place and that I'll constantly check on them to make sure that their safety is, is still intact. And then the morning that they're going to get on the stand, I will pick them up and I will take them to court and I will sit and with them as they go on the stand. They will look at me instead of looking at everyone else. They'll get to focus on me, uh, knowing that I'm making sure that they're gonna stay safe. So it's not just extreme babysitting. <laughs> it's, uh, it's ensuring that uh, justice happens.